I already talked a bit about the leveling changes coming to Torchlight Infinite in my Whispering Mist seasonal overview. But because leveling is so integral and because it's gotten such a big revamp that's changed not only the low level stuff in the campaign, but how you go through the Never Realm as well, I wanted to talk about it a bit more here to break it down in a dedicated video. Because it isn't just for the campaign's gone from five to three chapters, cutting out everything after you defeat Ordrak, which by the way, back in my day, we fought Ordrak for 30 minutes and liked it. For more about that, see my video on Torchlight 1. But no, 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 there's been a complete overhaul of so many things, a streamlining of multiple game systems. And overall, the goals are, number one, make the leveling process shorter. Number two, make it more difficult with harder enemies. And also limited attempts, some timers on bosses, etc. Number three, give players a smooth sense of progression. You know what your next upgrade is and know how to work towards it. So that is the lens through which I'm going to be working through all of this. That said, we won't know for sure until we actually play. So get subscribed, maybe leave a like while you're down there. That way you can see it all play out in practice when I try it once the season goes live. But for now, let's get into things in some more detail. First up, the number of rare items dropped in the campaign has been reduced, but the items have rarer slash more relevant affixes. The goal here is quality over quantity. You won't see trash on the floor constantly that you have to hide with your loot filter. When you do see something and pick it up, you're more likely to find a relevant upgrade. Additionally, as you level up, resistances are no longer reduced at 48, 58, and 80. Because the resistance cap has been moved from 75 down to 60, all affixes adjusted for this. And the idea is to simplify the process so people can more easily understand, all right, I need to get to 60 res, and this is how I do it, rather than, oh wait, I'm resistance capped and I leveled up. Why am I not resistance capped anymore? Personally, I think that this combined with a reincarnation numbers should make resistances much easier to deal with. The reincarnation number lets you reroll a resistance on an item to a different random resistance. Another change occurs in terms of when you acquire hero traits. Before you got them at level 9, 13, 32, 50, 62, and 80. You now get the first one for completing the Riverside quest. So it isn't tied to a specific level, it's quest completion. Then you get them at 25, 45, 60, 75, and 90. Overall later, which means characters that get a big massive power spike from their end talent may struggle a bit in the nether realm. Set bonuses could help with that though. More on that in a bit. Talent nodes have also been adjusted a bit. For the base trees, your major talents are now at level 12 and 24, which is a little later than the previous 10 and 20. But for all the advanced trees, it's at 16 and 32, down from 18 and 36, meaning the overall journey should lead to that more smooth progression feeling. But now that I've talked about a lot of the good things, the campaign has been made harder with direct buffs to enemies and the fact that the stages have attempts. So you can't just die 30 times to Keegan. If you die six times, then you're gonna have to try again. Speaking of Keegan, the major bosses now have a timer. So if you don't have enough DPS, you'll need to restart the fight. But to make up for this, they've added a loot zone where you get massive amounts of EXP and exclusive legendary items. So if this is something that everyone's expected to do, that you get to a certain point in a chapter, you hit a wall, you go grind in the loot zone, I think that's an inelegant solution to the problem of condensing five chapters worth of campaign EXP down into three. On the other hand, if this is something that expert players won't need, you can just blast through, but it's a tool to aid someone who's struggling, then I think it's a very good idea. I can absolutely see the value here, especially if someone is struggling within the campaign, we go, oh, I go here, I catch up, now I'm good to go and keep progressing. We'll just have to play with it to see how it plays out in practice. There have also been significant revamps to a lot of low level legendary items to make them more powerful and more usable, including things like triggering skills, applying curses automatically, lots of fun stuff. So as you're finding leveling uniques, now even non min builds should be able to find something useful for them. Taken in totality, these changes could make for a very fast and streamlined leveling experience. We go through the chapters in let's just say an hour and always have a fallback in the treasure trove if you reach a sticking point. On the other hand, the increase in difficulty could mean that even if you're an experienced player, you're going to get absolutely smashed on some of the boss fights or otherwise struggle to level through the campaign. This is very much a the poison is in the dose kind of thing. So I'm overall optimistic, but probably going into things with a little bit of caution. I'll try to grab some extra defenses and make sure I'm not just wearing floor trash or at the very least, make sure I'm not wearing floor trash from two chapters ago. 
Now, the Nether Realm progression has also been changed. There's also a series of cards which offer early and mid-game focused bonuses, allowing you to farm items. So as you're progressing through the Nether Realm, if you're saying, hey, I'm lacking damage, let me target my six piece, you go after these and hopefully you get it quite quickly. On the other hand, you no longer get free beacons when completing the Nether Realm quests, though you should still be able to head over to the vendor if you run out of beacons and need more. The Nether Realm zones, also when you unlock them, start with higher initial stages, more time marks automatically unlocked, and the bosses should require less stage attention points to progress, leading to a shorter grind to reach time mark seven, which is a welcome change because honestly, at least for me, the biggest grind was going from like time mark five where I felt like right, I'm ready to be in the end game up to time mark seven. It just took way too long and it was too boring and I didn't feel like I was getting that many relevant upgrades. The gameplay very much felt similar to time mark seven at that point. And I was just like, I'm ready to be done. Let me be done. Please let me be done. Now, hopefully I should be done before I get to that point. But by far the biggest change is the addition of item sets. These offer you bonuses as you equip them and are designed to basically give you a fallback build or something to play in the early game and mid game as you progress. They require level 50. They have some basic stats. There are seven different pieces. You can wear six of them to get a full six piece set. They are not intended to be your final build. This isn't Diablo sets that offer 25,000% increased damage. So now I'm gonna head over to the patch notes, take a look at things and give my best stab at interpreting them. Some of the wording is a little bit confusing though, and some of the bonuses will actually have to be played with. So do take this as the speculation that it is. Alrighty, and here we have the sets. This is the Voyager's commemorative set. There are seven pieces. Most of them have life, most of them have armor. They all have a random elemental resistance. Some have erosion res, some have some cool stats. They all have the set bonus and a hero trait exclusive affix. So these items are quite powerful. It's definitely going to be better than the random garbage that you big up off the ground. Most of the random garbage in my day one or day two videos. Yeah, um, this completely blows it out of the water. And because you can deterministically farm it by a trait cards, you'll absolutely get this set. So let's take a look at some of the set piece bonuses, talk about some builds that it might work for, and I'll also give some of my guesses as to how strong these sets are. Some are gonna be more powerful than others, but again, some hero traits need more help than others. So first up for Rahan Anger, you gain some rage, get some cooldown recovery and burst area. This seems purpose made to enhance train. Train is already really, really strong. I don't think this is the most powerful set bonus on the list, but also train doesn't need that much help. So it's really good, and especially the two-piece I could see sticking around for a long time. Remember, the two-piece is the most accessible, and the six-piece is the hardest. Then for Seething Silhouette, for Rage, you gain additional attack damage, which actually kind of seems like something that you might want to keep for a really long time, because you could get a very significant amount of that by stacking max Rage. Then you get Rage Consumption, and upon entering Berserk, three seconds of Seething Spirit on a 10-second cooldown. Overall, not bad. Seems pretty generic for any sort of attack build that you want to play. And let's be honest, if you're not playing an attack build, you're probably not playing Seething Spirit. And we have Windstalker, Lightning Damage Dealt by Steep Strike. Hmm, that seems a little familiar. Where Christ cast immediately, that's a great quality of life. You can use it for defense, damage, healing. And during multi-strike, each attack has a 30% chance for plus one Steep Strike. Yeah, uh, this is very much purpose made for Thunder Slash, which is kind of Erica's whole gimmick. Not that you can't convert other skills like, let's just say, Berserking Blade over to Lightning and do the very same thing. Then on Lightning Shadow, you've got Movement Speed, Phantom Detection Area, which is a, a pretty niche one, to be honest with you. That's Shadow Skills. And then enemies within 10 meters receive an additional 20% Lightning Damage. So really, you can do any type of damage you want, so long as it's Lightning and you are relatively close range. I could see this working for either Thunderstorm, Lightning Cloud, uh, Thunder Slash again any sort of lightning convert builds. There's quite a few options. Then we've got Ranger of Glory. Chance to reload special ammo. All right, that should help with damage consistency. Some crit when consuming special ammo. Helps some crit cap. Not that he necessarily needed that. And then for every point of fervor, gain 1% crit damage. When magic shot is lost, lose 50 points of fervor. So basically a really awkward thing that requires that you also have fervor. I don't really like this one. I'm not saying it's not powerful. I am saying it's going to feel very bad to play around. 
especially given that there's more playstyles than just the aim for permanent magic shot on Carino. As for what skills, uh, any projectile skill, but in particular, it's probably going to be something like lightning shot because that tends to be the go-to on him. Then we have lethal flash, where you gain projectile speed and damage for subsequent projectiles in shotgun effect up to 30%. Kind of curious if that is up to 30% damage, up to 30% projectile speed, or up to 30% on both, meaning that you would technically need 100 projectiles. Then projectile speed, this is a lot of quality of life. When reloading, ammunition for mobility skills and equal amount of magazine capacity upper limit is also provided, lasting for eight seconds. And no, I don't know what I said either. Uh, to try to translate this, I think what it means is when you use a mobility skill to reload, it increases your ammo and also increases your maximum for the next eight seconds up to 30%. I think that is what it means, but it is very confusingly worded here. In which case, the more projectiles that you can fit in, the better. And so I'm thinking Split Firebolt, uh, Frostfire Gemma, Elemental Destruction Curse. That is, I think, the strongest two-piece bonus that I've seen yet. Free Curse on Hit. Eventually, it'll get replaced, but for an early mid-game thing, really, really good, especially with the change to triggers. Then Frostfire Rampage Duration is nice quality of life and just 20% fire and cold damage, which a lot of the time should double dip because bonuses to fire apply to cold and bonuses to cold apply to fire. Uh, as long as you're doing fire or cold damage, this is quite good. In particular, there's always the classic of like Flame Slash. On the other hand, you can go with a spell. Frost Terror, though, Frost Terror is better on Yoga and Frostbitten Heart, but I've seen some people do it. And you can go with the good old Path of Flame stuff with Repurification Nonsense, should be really, really strong. Oh, and Ignite. Ignite will be awesome with this. You have a free curse, you get extra Rampage for extra Ignites. Yeah. Next up, we've got Frostbitten Heart. When Cold Pulse hits, it applies additional points of Frostbite, so you freeze things faster, that's good. Freeze effect, that's good. That means things stay frozen faster. When inflicting freeze, there's a 30% chance to trigger a blizzard, frost bond, or frost terror. So spell spam. This should be a very powerful baseline effect that won't scale particularly well. And for this, uh, you already want to freeze. I don't have any specific build recommendations because it's very, very generic. On flame of pleasure, damage ratio for brand records. Then you've got purgatory duration, so you'll have higher uptime on your purgatory, being able to more efficiently brand stuff. And then this is a positive. I know it says minus 15%, but minus 15% is not a negative here. Death by fire usually removes all the damage stored by your brand to deal damage. Now it is removing less of that damage. So you store it up and continue to deal damage to enemies. Overall, this is really good for builds that have high single target but are lacking in clear. Bing, uh, one of the characters that I still haven't played, actually, might be the only character at this point that I haven't played. I just don't really like the trap slash mine playstyle. So, cooldown recovery speed, skill effect duration, seems decent. Then, projectile skill area, good if you're using area projectiles, but not all of them are. And then, bomb throwing quantity, which I think is quite good. But that's just based off of thinking that more bombs are better. If you play Bing, feel free to correct me. Uh, like I said, this is the one character that I haven't played. Then we have Spacetime Witness, Spacetime Illusion, which was actually the first character I played. Plus two to spell skill level, that is really strong. Later on, sure, you'll get a ton of levels from your weapon. Early game though, really good. Then additional illusion damage. The illusion is great in the early game. You can just kite bosses in circles and have your illusion deal damage for you. Then this is cool because this is a mechanical change. After taking fatal damage, you lose the illusion and you use the power of space time to become immune to that instance of damage. You knock back enemies and you restore 30% of life and energy shield. So you get a 10 second cooldown cheat death, but it eats your clone, which might make you a little sad. That is very cool. That is very strong. I know there's the old yoga ice lances, but pretty much anything yoga spell burst, really, really good with all this. And you should be able to resummon the clone relatively quickly after it gets eaten by this effect. Just remember it has a 10 second cooldown. Then we have space time elapse, whose two piece bonus is pretty much gibberish. Then some affliction effect, which is nice. And some reaping cooldown, which is very, very welcome in the early game. 
Overall, one of the weaker bonuses, but Elapse is one of the stronger characters. I know Mind Control just got nerfed by about 20% directly on the skill itself, and possibly some auxiliary nerfs from other things in the game. Overall, though, the character's in probably the best spot it's been in since beta. So, if you want to play Elapse, he's looking like a pretty decent choice. And then we have Thea, Wisdom of the Gods. For every stack of focus blessing, gain crit strike up to a maximum of 150. It's a really good way to cap out your crit early. Then when activating spell burst, gain one stack of tenacity and agility. That's insane. And plus two max focus. Yeah, insane bonuses. Uh, stack stuff, play spell burst. Probably play icy rain. Then incarnation of the gods. Steep strike damage, so we're looking at things like Thunder Slash, Flame Slash, and Berserking Blade here. The Steep Strike Classics. 10% chance to cause an explosion. Okay, so you get free Exploded Clear and free Blessings. That seems like a really powerful bonus. I especially like that it has Explodey, so infinite clear. I kind of wonder, does that mean that she could clear really efficiently with Thunder Slash? Do you kill enough enemies? for a 10% chance to proc. Seems cool. Would have to test that. What they're calling you get overload duration. This is really good, so you keep overload up 100% of the time. Overload effect uh, makes what it does better. What it does keeps changing though. And each time overload is applied, gain one command point. So command is pretty integral to order calling. It makes your minions stronger and it naturally decays the more of it you have. This way you can constantly spam overload and get a little more command. I don't think the six piece bonus is all that impactful, but the two and four is very nice. Then for charge calling, overload cooldown recovery to make your minions explode more efficiently. That's good. When we initiate self-destruct, there's a 6% chance to drop a mechanical part, which you can then use to summon more minions, which self-destruct dropping more mechanical parts. And when picking up parts, there's a chance to gain command. So you'll get some passive command generation. Overall, very good and uh, especially good, I would say, if you're not using the auto resummoning versions and you're going with normal minions that are just a little bit more reliant on the mechanical parts. Probably spider tanks, but who knows? Some people like blowing up their golems too. We've got Rosa. Regenerate four points of murderous intent every second. With gear, murderous intent regen is very easy. Without it, it can be a challenge, so this is nice. Upon defeating an enemy, trigger a level 10 burst of anger. Okay, so free bonuses while clearing. And for every 10 seconds, the next use of a trait skill gains an additional effect. Eliminate all non-elite units within the range of holy illumination and grant all units 20% size and damage. Huh. So does this buff the enemies? Or does this, this part buff you and this part kill enemies? Because automatically killing all non-elites is hilarious, especially if you pull enemies in and they just get annihilated instantly. If you're giving the enemies size and damage, that's not necessarily the best, but if you're only giving yourself size and damage or maybe you and your allies, oh man, that's a really strong one. And something like Ground Shaker, that'll clean up those elites in no time. Last up, we have Iris. So in the Spirit Magi, I use a skill. There's an 8% chance to lose one layer of nourishment. Wait. Is that in addition to the baseline chance or does that reduce the baseline chance? Again, wording is confusing here. Plus one to skill level, that makes sense, that's good. Then every four seconds it gains a massive buff. Okay. For how long though? Is it a four second buff? I really wish there was a duration on this buff because I wonder if you can have it up on multiple spirit magi or if it's one only. Uh, either way, this one seems very strong and it's uh, time to play Frost Spirits again. Except I probably won't be playing Frost Spirits because activation mediums changed my mind. When it comes to sets, I really dislike their implementation in Diablo 3. I don't want a set bonus to be my build. Now, in theory, I did like their implementation in Last Epoch, where it's a leveling aid and mostly isn't used in the endgame. But in Last Epoch, they ended up being a little bit too weak. It was a little bit too easy to just replace it with exalted items off the floor. So I'm hoping that sets in Torchlight Infinite hit that beautiful middle ground where they're useful in the early game, but never the ultimate end game option. Now that aside, more difficulty in the campaign means you have to pay more attention. Well, I think this is a good idea in theory, especially for someone's first run through. And I do, generally speaking, enjoy challenging games. When I'm leveling my third character of the season, I don't really want difficulty or challenge during the leveling process. So as long as it's something that you can easily overcome by wearing a little bit of extra gear, then it is a good thing. 
but if it's going to be too challenging, uh, that's not going to be very fun, and I think it'll turn a lot of people off of the game. That said, this is a mobile game, and XD very much knows their audience, so I don't expect it to be that hard. And last up, the overall streamlining of the process, making things simpler, faster to get to time mark 7 and beyond. Very, very good. I'm a big fan of it, and cutting out those extra filler chapters, definitely a good idea at this point. So personally, I'd say these are good changes. I look forward to trying them, and then sharing my thoughts with all of you. With that said, if you want to read more about what's coming in Whispering Mist, I'll leave a link to both my video and the article on Maxwell up in the card and down below. You can check that out after this. Before I go, I'd like to take a minute to thank my patrons and channel members for the continued support. For as low as $1 a month, you can all make videos just like this one possible. Link to support is also down below. And if you're looking for something a little bit different, maybe check out some of the content I've been putting up on my second channel. Recently, I tried the demo for Tales of Kinzara Zhao, and honestly, I really liked it. But that's all for me today. Thanks for watching to the end. I hope you enjoyed this deeper dive into the leveling changes coming to Torchlight Infinite, and I'll see you again sometime soon.